I'm always privileged. You know, you get to stand before people and share about God. It's a huge, huge responsibility. So just bow your heads. I want to pray for a moment. Father, we thank you. We thank you. I thank you. Father, we settle our hearts and our minds in you. Just take a moment just to settle. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you, Lord, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Lord, I pray that you would fill all of us with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this grace, God. We love you. We appreciate you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think the young lady that was up here, she was very prophetic because I asked Pastor Taylor, how long shall I preach? And he said, just preach. Just go until you're done. And she said, tonight. So I guess... <laughs> you guys are already going to have food. Just bring your food in and we just keep going, you know? <clears throat> but, <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm honored to be before you guys. Pastor Taylor, Pastor Caleb, those are my guys. I mean, I, I met them not too long ago. And uh, they, they feel like brothers. I love those, those, those gentlemen. And uh, I'm also privileged to have my queen with me here this morning, August. <laughs> The second best thing that ever happened to me besides the Holy Ghost is my wife. So I'm on it. All right, you guys. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right, let's dive in. Um, if you could meet me, meet me at Revelations uh, chapter 12. Revelations chapter 12. Now, you, you guys are more experienced than me. Am I allowed to move around down here and stuff too? Okay, okay. Didn't know if I was in bondage. I needed to ask first. <laughs> I'd be like, this is last time. He was all on the floor. His last time coming. Um, so, 2023. 2023, that's where we are right now. Um, very amazing that God... Before the worlds existed, before earth, before creation, he already seen 2023. Imagine you having special access to see a movie. You know, I just seen Paw Patrol 2, <laughs> Mighty Pups. Um, and uh, it just came out, what, two days ago, Friday? What's today? I don't even know. My life has been like that. I'm just walking in no time. Um, but imagine being able to see that movie a month ago, and then everybody else has to wait until September 29th to see it. So everyone is, is about to catch up to something you already seen. Everybody's, we're getting ready to experience something you already saw. And that's how it is with God. He absolutely 1,000% prophesied and talked about today. And when you look at our culture and you look at the evolution of man, it's something that God already seen. He already knew that man will start trying to redefine nature. 
when man tries to redefine nature, that's man trying to take the place of God. He knew there would be modern-day technology, you know, the advancement in the medical community. He knew that there would be an outpouring of magic and spiritual activity. He was fully aware that, you know, AI would come into existence, artificial intelligence, that it would lead to, you know, this half-man, half-machine. They're now saying that through technology they can have man live forever. People not die. You know, the Bible prophesies there are a day coming where people will beg to die, and they can't. Prophesy wars and unique, you know, when, you, when I used to read the book of Revelations back in the day, um, you know, it was just hard because you're looking at all these symbols and all these, you know, the dragon, the woman in the sky, what a baby. And I'm like, what is, what kind of movie is this? Um, but now it's making more sense. When I see what man is able to do with technology and what they're able to cre- create, and you have, you know, it's vocalized among scientists that they heard voices saying, let us in, and they, they're diving into opening up, you know, portals and all this stuff we've seen in movies that we just thought were entertainment, were ideas. And the Bible captured it all. So Revelations 12, if you can imagine diving deeper into the future, if you can imagine God allowing you to see Paul patrol 30 days before, he's like, I want you guys to be prepared. I want you guys to know what's coming. And I love the book of Revelations because if you, if you pronounce the entire entitlement or title, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was the most feared book in the Bible for me growing up, but it's probably the one that has the most victory. The one that actually brings the most hope. Because it lets you know in spite of all the activity, he's going to be revealed. Amen? Amen. Um, can we go to verse, actually, can we start at verse 7? We're going to do Revelation 12. We're going to start at verse 7. You guys there? Okay. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but did not prevail. Nor was a place found for him in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole, what's that last word right there? World. That is crazy to me. It said that he deceived the whole world. Now, that sounds like that's scary for you and I, but we're in the world, but he was cast to the earth and his angels was was cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God And the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. Here we go. And they, and they, the brethren, the ones that he had been accusing, and they overcame him by the blood of of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to death. This is the only 
verse, passage, or place in the Bible where it talks about you overcoming the devil. Now, Jesus, we know he overcame him back on the cross, defeating the principalities, and, but and Paul in Ephesians talked about wrestling. So can you send it real quick? What's your name? Wrestling, Danny. Danny, Danny, send it real. So Danny, let's wrestle. All right. All right, not, not for real. Okay. Okay. You're bigger than I am. I don't want to so. throw you on the table. Know. My <laughs> wife is watching. You know, I have to. WWE. Okay, so, so this is what? You know. <laughs> Woo! No, it's good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, but this is, this is a contest. This is going back and forth. So John is not talking about going back and forth. John is talking about overcoming. He said, the way you end the wrestling match, the way you and I end wrestling with cancer and generational curses, and the way you end that is that you come to a revelation of something. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Watch the next part. And the word of their, so in order to have a testimony, you have to have a what? A test, a trial. So it's not just you preaching something you ain't living. It's you've been through something, seen the blood work, and because of the revelation you have, you no longer love your life unto death because you realize the moment you do, You'll never overcome him. Jesus said those that look to save their life will lose it. But those that will lose their life for my sake will gain life. And one of the biggest ways he's still overcoming us is that we are too in love with our own life. We found a way to love what Jesus paid to kill. You guys know this. What is baptism? The death of who? If any man would come after me, let him first deny the devil, deny himself. I mean, it's one thing to talk about defeating the devil. I mean, we can look at a bunch of scriptures that talk about he's already defeated. So if he's defeated, what would be the only issue? What if spiritual warfare was just exposing the part of us that's still alive? Jesus said, listen, the ruler of this world is coming. But he has nothing in me. Meet me, First Corinthians. Let's do chapter eleven. Twenty-three. Twenty-three in my Bible. Stands for Michael Jordan, not LeBron. I'm just, you know, just putting it out there. There's, there's a lot of deception going on in the world. But I still believe I can fly. Can I get a witness? No, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> 23 and 23. This is Paul. This is incredible to me because you guys know this. All right, I, I hope you guys join us for School of Reform. It's a shameless plug, but... I won't have enough time to go through all of this, but um, <clears throat> so you have like this, like cars, you know how cars have different tiers. <laughs> you go to the dealership and you're like, oh, this is a nice car. And I was like, oh yeah, that's our base model. It doesn't have windows. It doesn't have air conditioner. It doesn't have, <laughs> this, and you're like, okay, so what do I have to pay to get a window? Like what's the, well, that's the base plus. 
and you just get one air conditional vent, you know, <laughs> AC vent. The apostles, there were tears to, to the, the classes of the apostles. So the chief apostle was Jesus. Hebrews 3.1 said that he was the apostle and high priest of our profession. So he was in the class by himself. You guys remember when uh, before the woman came out of Adam, she was in Adam? That's how it was like with Jesus. You're looking at the apostolic before the church came out of him. So you're seeing the fullness of the apostolic, the fullness of the prophetic. You're seeing the fullness of all these things because at this point, the head and the body is one. You have just the Lord here. Afterwards, he released this anointing. He gave gifts to men and dispersed measures of himself to different people. And now if we want to experience the fullness of him, we got to come together in unity. Because you carry a piece I don't carry, and you carry a piece I don't. Okay, so it's, it's, it's all of us coming together to show that we're the body of. Okay, so Jesus walked in a measure of anointing like no one else. Okay. <clears throat> then the second tier of the apostles, or the apostolic, was the 12. They were unique because their apostolic responsibility was to be eyewitnesses of what they seen, what they heard, and what they experienced. So when they were replacing Judas, they said the qualifications in 121 of Acts it has to be someone who was there from the baptism of John that watched Jesus get baptized to the day he was taken up. And then they cast lots and it was Matthew that they chose. So that particular class was unique because you had to be an eyewitness of the life of Jesus. And they also helped lay the foundation of the New Testament. The third class was the, was the class that the Apostle Paul was in. He called himself a, a, a wise master builder. He was a, a foundational apostle. Ephesians what, 2, 20 said that the church was built on the, the, uh, built on the apostles and prophets and they laid the foundation. So the apostle Paul did not get the opportunity to be with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Yet when Jesus came and revealed the gospel to him, he made sure he revealed this part specifically to him because it was so essential. So he had this encounter with Jesus, and you imagine him and Jesus talking, and Jesus is saying, hey, what I'm about to share with you is going to be so critical because it is the Christian life. What I'm about to reveal to you, Paul, is the Christ life. So he starts off and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my what? This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay, let's keep going. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, as so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself. We're going to stay right here. Not discerning the Lord's body. When I used to read this, and it was taught to me this way growing up, that if you didn't deal with your sin before you ate and drank, you're actually bringing judgment to yourself. Now, I had to... Go back to the Lord on this because I'm like, something just, you know, it's just the Lord was reteaching me. The blood of Jesus is for sin. 
The blood of Jesus is poured out to take away sin. John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So how could this verse mean that if I came to the table with sin and I took the blood, I'm bringing judgment on myself when the blood is for sin? So that couldn't be what he means by eating this or drinking this in an unworthy manner. He said, because they did not discern the Lord's body. You guys see that? Did not discern the Lord's body. What does discern mean, discernment? Discern is like, it will, technically it means to understand. So, you know, my mom had such an incredible level of discernment. She would set me up. Her and the Lord would already know what I did. And so she would ask me, hey, Brandon, just got a quick question for you. I know I told you, to, you know, not to do this. And that. Did you do that? And I'm like, no, of course I didn't do that. Oh, I'm going to give you one more time. And I know what that means. So I'm like, why are you even asking me if you know that? But she had discernment. She knew where we were. She knew when we were lying. She had an understanding of what was taking place. Paul said, when we don't discern or understand the Lord's body, we can't partake from it. We can't receive what it was paid to give because we don't understand what it was paid to give. So when we don't understand what the blood and the body has done for us, next verse, for this reason, what reason? Not discerning. Many are weak and sick among you. And many sleep means died early. What's the reverse effect? When we discern the Lord's body and his blood, there'll be strength among us. There'll be healing among us. And we'll live out our days. Y'all can clap. Hey, hallelujah. That's the word. <laughs> so think about the two passages we just read. How do you overcome the devil? Okay, the blood, testimony, and not loving your life. Okay, now how does he overcome you? Not discerning the Lord's body. Weak, sick, dying early. He's like, you can have any other topic. You can learn about Jezebel and all. As long as you don't come into a revelation of the blood, we're fine. Host as many marriage seminars as you, as you like. Go through all the deliverance sessions. See people get free. But they'll never walk in freedom if we don't discern the Lord's body. So we've made it a first Sunday thing at church. We made it some religious practice. And we just hurry up and take the blood so we can rush and get the Advil. Now, I'm not knocking Advil. I just reverse the order. I say, Lord, I'm pressing into this revelation. And this is going to be my training wheel until I get here. But this is not where I'm ending. And because of life, we start to settle. We pray, we tried it, we tried God, 
When people say, try God, test him and see. We don't try God. He's not a 30-day. You don't try God. You give your life to him, period. Faith is not a moment in time. Well, you know, we try God long enough. Well, now it's time to use wisdom. And we make faith a season of our life instead of something that we live by. And the disappointment of us not seeing what we wanted to see causes us to be friends with the world. And now we start to incorporate more psychology in life by the Spirit. And we call it wisdom. And we say, y'all need to live, y'all need to be for real. And we sanctify and make holy emotions and experience that God is trying to kill. And we pull back on God. We pull back and we just start to coast and live a normal life. And we confess him, but we show that we do not discern. So how are we going to overcome the devil? So here's what we do. We just put all of our hope in leaving earth and going to go be with God. We wait for that time because then we'll finally be free. And this, it's like, so you know this, Jesus' part was to redeem man, okay? He's going to purchase something. You know what redemption means, it's just to buy something, it's to purchase something. So Jesus is like, my blood and my life is going to buy, I'm going to purchase humanity back. So he purchased humanity, and the apostles, he's like, hey, I'm getting ready to leave. And they're like, where are you going to go? I mean, what do you, what you mean? Where are you going, Jesus? And he was like, it's better for you that I go away. Why? Because I'm just redemption. Someone else is restoration. His name is Holy. I'm going to redeem you, but he is going to take you back to what God intended. The ministry of the Spirit is restoration. Holy Spirit comes in your life to bring you out of the the way you've been thinking, the way you've been living. He comes to empower you to live like the one that's redeemed you. But when you and I forfeit because of life, we quench what he can do because we don't believe in what he can do. Life in the spirit is taboo. We don't even really know what it means to walk in the spirit. Most denominationalism, it's not over Jesus. It's over the Holy Spirit. Do we speak in tongues or don't we speak in tongues? Is deliverance for today or isn't it for today? It's all about his ministry that we can't get on the same page with, but we're all called to walk in the Spirit. So what is God doing in 2023? I believe he's bringing back this revelation of the blood and the body so that we can start walking in victory today. And it's going to be by his spirit. Now, I love life by the spirit. As I'm, as I'm learning, I'm like, wow, this is so much better because I, I used to think about God through laws and systems and traditions and all this kind of stuff, right? I see we've got some teenagers in here. I'm not saying that anybody's old. <laughs> I'm just saying I see we have some teenagers, and the Lord has given me a special tongue for teenagers, Okay, some special language. Okay, lit, bruh. Uh, so I got to make sure I'm multicultural in here, okay? Y'all got to help me. But um, the, when I used to think about God, I would think about God with all these rules and what you couldn't do and what you could do. And I'm like, bruh, this is like being in jail. I mean, my God, can't control the lights. You just, 
And, and what it did, it tried to make me live something that felt very unnatural. Has a Christian life ever felt unnatural? Like, I really don't want to do this. Like, but you, you, and it feels like there's something you're forcing. You know, you're making yourself. And then we see those verses like Paul saying, I beat my flesh every day to live for God. And it looks so holy and all that stuff. Until I'm like, wait a minute. And I went back to Genesis. And once again, I'm in this, I've just been in this place for like 10 years. Lord has just been reteaching me. And I'm like, wait a minute. The flesh in Genesis went evil. This thing that we talking about crucify, I'm like, it wasn't evil. Matter of fact, when Adam woke up from his nap, he looked at this woman and said, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. I think he probably said some other stuff too. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when you think about the flesh, it, was, it is the only thing in creation that can contain God. In the beginning, all of its appetites, that desire to be loved and to be valued, all of that was natural. It was just plugged into God. So it was satisfied through its connection to God. So he could say flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, and not put her before God. He could look at her through purity. He could still want to be with her, but it's not driving his life. It was beautiful. So, if the Son of Man, Jesus, if he's coming to seek and save that which was lost, if he's coming to bring things back to how it was, then killing this is not how it was. It's plugging it back to its source. So that the Christian life can be satisfying, that it can be natural, like you naturally crave for love. You naturally crave for peace. You naturally crave for joy. These are natural things that are satisfied in God. But if you think about God as rules and regulations, your heart will never be postured for satisfaction. It'll be postured to serve God, and that's different. And that's different. Are you guys okay? Okay. Y'all looking at me like, either this is good or y'all hungry. <laughs> it's like, he keep holding up this bread, girl. I'm about to just eat mine now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So do this with me, and I'm, I'm going to get you guys out of here. Uh, Take your communion cups. If you have a Bible, if you have your, uh, your phone, you could, it's cool. I want you to put your communion cup on top of the book of Acts. Find Acts with your Bible and then take your cup and just place it on top of that. Eleven thirty-six. We started at what? What time did church start? Ten thirty. My look, I, we we go to church in uh, Louisville, and we have a nine a.m., uh, ten thirty, and a twelve thirty service. So I just I just you know. And then we went to a gala last night. It was so fun. My wife was dressed up. She looked amazing, and uh, our kids went with us. <laughs> you know, it's just a long night. It's just you know. Woke up thinking it was yesterday. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop. All right. Um, okay, so in, in uh, Deuteronomy 30, I think it's verse 19, the Lord says, I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. And he says, choose life that you and your children may live. God is very black and white, you know. He... Uh, He's amazing. It's like, he's like the ocean. 
Like, you know that the ocean is made up of H2O. You know it's water, but it's the depths of the ocean and all the things that you find in the ocean that brings you in awe. And it's like God. God is very black and white. He's love, but it's the depths of, of his love and how he manifests that, 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 you know, that brings us in awe. But he's very simple. He said there's life and there's death. There's blessings and there's curses because I choose life. Life is a type of life. Life is a type of life. When God talks about life, he's talking about a specific type of existence. He's talking about a specific way of living. He's talking about a specific condition. When he says life, he's talking about um, a specific lifestyle. When he's talking about death, likewise, death is a type of life. Death is a type of, of existence. Death is a, is, has a lifestyle. So when Jesus says to you that he's come that you may have life, John 10, 10, that he's coming that you may have life and life more abundantly, a person could say, well, I'm already living. What do you mean you're going to give me life? I'm already alive. Because they're thinking about life as just existing. But Jesus is like, no, I want to give you a certain type of life. You know, um, um, you know, when you look at the celebrities, they have a certain type of life. That people, you know, desire to have. They look at the money, they look at the fame, they look at the cars, and they say, ooh, I wish I had their life. They're saying they want a specific type of life. And Jesus is saying, hey, I have a specific type of life too. That if you come to me, I want to give you the type of life that I have. And he says, death is a type of life. What is the type of life of death? Well, you know this, man used to be connected to God, the cord got cut in the fall of man, and now man is separated from God, that's called death. It's a life that's dead to what they had with God. They no longer have what they had with God. So they're separated from him, and they're living apart from him. The Bible calls that death. So the Bible ceasing to exist was never a definition in the Bible for death. You never cease to exist. You just can exist apart from God. You can have a different way of living, way of thinking, and lifestyle. So the Lord said, I set before you death and life. Choose life. Choose this lifestyle, this way that involves me. Okay, now I'm going to speed up a little bit. You guys okay? Yeah. All right, cool. I feel like I'm at home now. Y'all ready? No. Nice. Yeah. All right, so there's only one life that Jesus came to live. It's called the life of Christ. When, Peter asked, when Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? He says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ is a type of life. It's a life that Holy Spirit empowers people to live. It's unique because no other person in the Bible had the life of Christ. David had the anointing or the Holy Spirit was upon David to be a king, to be a priest, to be a prophet. Holy Spirit was on Abraham to be a prophet, on Moses to be a prophet, on Elijah to be a prophet, on Hezekiah to be a king. He had craftsmen that he anointed to build things. Noah had the anointing to build. These are different ways that Holy Spirit was moving upon these men, but none of them had the anointing or the life of Christ. Christ is a unique kind of life because it empowers you to reveal what God is like. It empowers you to reveal God. Jesus came as the second Adam. He didn't come as God, I'm not present, I'm not potent, omniscient, and all that kind of stuff. He laid that aside and came as man. But man before the court was cut. So he's coming as what, he's coming in the form of what God intended for you and I. So he says, listen, I'm a model of what you're called to be, so follow me because I'm the example for your life. But he also said to see me is to see the Father. 
Now, what do you mean to see you to see the Father? You only came as the second Adam. Yeah, because Adam was made in the image of God. So to see Adam was to see the Father because he's talking about nature, love, his, 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 his character and how he does things. So Jesus brings that back to the earth, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out being the Christ. So if you want to know what God is thinking, you can look at Jesus because he's the express image of his thoughts of his heart and his ways. So this this specific life is called the life of Christ. Now, Acts Acts 17, 26 says, through one blood, one blood, God has called all the nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. So God made one blood, one bloodline, one blood type. It wasn't type A, type B, and type, it didn't have all these, we didn't have all these different type of blood types. We had one blood type. God wanted one family. So he brought one man, brought one woman, told them to be fruitful and multiply so that all of us would have one blood, one spirit, come from one family, one name, it'll all be oneness. And to see you is to see myself. He's not talking about the color of my skin. God is a spirit, so man being made in the image of God, he's not talking about a flesh and bone body. He's not talking about two arms, two legs, and a, and a face. God is spirit. He don't have those things. But yet man is made in his image. So he's talking about spiritually, the spiritual nature of God, man is called to reveal. You guys are with me so far? Okay, so when you look at Jesus coming and living this kind of life, He's modeling not only the lifestyle, but the ingredients necessary to live this way. You don't just look at Jesus and go do what he did. You need what he had in order to do what he did. And what did he have? He had the Holy Spirit, amazing. He had relationship with the Father, amazing. And then he had a certain kind of blood. Now, God's intent was through one blood. That blood got contaminated, it was lost, and now we got over eight different blood types when God made one. So in the redemption plan, what did God do? He said, I'm going to bring one blood type. And I'm going to invite all those different eights into a new one. The very life that he lived was not just because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was on David too. And David didn't live like Jesus. Holy Spirit was on Moses too, and he didn't live like Jesus. Esther and she didn't live like Jesus. So what's the difference? They're missing something else. 1 John 5 said there's three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. And then there's three that bear witness in the earth, the water, the Spirit, and the blood, and these three agree as one. The blood of Jesus carries the life of God. If I want to find out anything, I went to the doctor and, uh, and he took some blood maybe like two months ago and I, my wife, she knows I get a little weird. I was like, doctor, can you talk to me about the blood? Just, you know. And he was like, well, you want to know? Well, I said, I heard that, you know, you basically you could look at my blood and tell me what, you know, different things about my genetics. You could talk to me about what diseases. You could talk to me what's hereditary. You can like explain basically my whole life. He said, yeah, pretty much that your blood carries everything about you. Your health condition. Yeah, I remember Jerry Springer. I see some Jerry Springer saints up in here. Some of y'all I think I've seen on the show. But the moment that envelope came out, that brother got nervous. And they opened up the envelope and they got Steve over there ready. And they opened up the envelope. Johnny, you are the father. And they had the blood test. Because the blood test shows you who your father is. You know they do the side-by-side pictures, side-by-side images. And she said, look, Jerry, he got his nose, his eyes. What is she saying? He got his image. So there's no way you can tell me, Jerry, that this child can have this father's image without this being his blood. So they look at the blood and say, you're right. Y'all good? 
So Leviticus 17, 14 says, the life of the creature is in its blood. You're amazing. I see you, Adam. I mean, uh, Aaron, I see you back like there working, sir. For it is the life of all flesh. It's blood. Verse 11. I love this one too because it says it's the, it's the blood that sustains this life. 1711 says this. I thought, you know, I thought we was. Seven. <laughs> Look at this. For the life of the flesh is. In the, so if you're looking at a, a, a flesh, a body, and the way they live in, the scripture's saying the life of it is in its blood. So if, if Jesus said that if, if a person would lay down his life, he would give them his life, guess what he has to give them? His blood. Because his life, his health, his relationship with the Father, his image is in his blood. Amen. John 6, he said, if you don't eat of my flesh or drink my blood, you have no part in me. The Christian life is, is not figurative, it's literal. You literally become a new creation. It's something that actually happens. You actually receive the Spirit of God. We actually become born again. Amen? Amen. So you put your communion cup on the book of Acts, right? Some of y'all, y'all got your communion cup on your, on your phone. That's, that's so good. From this chapter or book on is all about that blood. Not just about, it is the life that that blood gives. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus hadn't died yet. So he's really prophesying about a new life that's to come. After his death, he brings a new life. So upon him dying, he sits down at the table and they take communion. And he prepares them for a new covenant. So Matthew 26, 26 says, take, drink, this is my blood of a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He's saying the moment my blood is shed, there's an opportunity now for a new covenant, a new life, a new agreement with God. I'm saying all of what I said to say this one thing. You and I have to change the way we commune with God. Some of our figurative thinking has has caused us not to literally partake of what God has made available. Everything is a type and a shadow in our mind. Everything is an example, a representation. Now, this bread isn't the physical body of Jesus, right? But it is a revelation saying that I now am his body here on the earth. And just like the, the nutrients and all the stuff that his body has, my body. God brought, God brought a race into the earth. God brought a special, like the scriptures call you an alien. They showing us pictures in Mexico of aliens. No, they should come to church and take pictures of y'all and say, we got aliens here. <laughs> they walking around pulling people out of wheelchairs. We're seeing stuff disappear that we ain't never seen disappear. We tried to poison them and they eating stuff and nothing's harming them. What kind of race is this? They're they're casting out devils and all this stuff and what is this? What is man? Man. 
That's us. And I love the scriptures. We'll end where we started. In Revelations, when all this craziness is going on in the world, John said there's a group of people that's going to understand the blood and overcome. Amen. I think that's us. Amen. I think that's why you brought your communion. I think that's why you're here. But what does that require? It requires you and I honestly, transparent, apparently, and being willing to let go of our bad experience with prayer, with our expectations, the stuff that's causing us not to believe God and his word, we have to be willing to let that stuff go. Amen. You have to continue to challenge these areas in your life that don't reflect him. And how do you challenge them? By going back to him, going back to his word, saying, I know it's true. I know there's nothing wrong with what you said. I know that you're the truth. There's something in me that's keeping me from seeing it. I'm here humble before you, God, saying change that. Amen. I watched my mom pass from cancer. I watched stuff happen in my life that your word said that wouldn't happen if I laid my hands. I laid my hands and it didn't happen. Now what, God? And after you see that four, five, six times, you just say, well, God heals some and others he don't heal. And now we make God look like he's partial. Or after enough divorces, we just give up on marriage and say, well, I guess it's just meant for me to be a eunuch. And we just, and we just give up and we just say we're going to just live normal lives. We, we could go through this room and everybody tell horrific stories. And we can compare everybody's story. Well, who has the worst story in? And then we create a circle around the person who has the worst situation and we pray for them, not in faith, but out of sympathy. And we have empathy for them and we just wanna try to pray to make them feel emotionally better instead of having compassion and revealing that there's more to the life that they're living because we've all had life. Amen? Amen. So that's us being willing to lay down our lives to take up a new one. And here's the deal. God doesn't have any other way. He doesn't have any other answer. He doesn't have an, another way of doing it. It's just, it's just one way. And it's a better way. You know, narrow is the road that leads to life. And he says... It's, it's a difficult way. Very few find it. People preach that that's heaven. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the life that he has. Very few people actually discover that life. Once you get through that narrow way, it is as big and as wide as life can be. But it requires us to be willing to go through the narrow way of saying, I'm willing to deny my life. I'm willing to renounce the hidden things in my heart. I'm willing to revisit stuff that I know that's causing a wall in me. I'm willing to forgive people that have come against me. I'm willing to forgive myself. I'm willing to start over. I mean, why wouldn't you give up the stuff that's been keeping you down? Why would you hold to the stuff that's been keeping you bound? What would make you want to hold to that? But I'm young, but I've been in church my whole life. I'm a PK, and I've been preaching for a little, a little while now. And you see people that just don't want to. They just don't want to. They just choose not to. At every church I go to, you, just, you see a few that's just like, I'm just kind of over God in this. I don't want to. 
You don't judge them. Judge them. You just you sow a seed in faith and believe in it. God, to, you know, bring healing. I was it's my, I'm just a quick testimony. I was in New York. Me and my wife was. Uh, anybody know who uh, Naomi Rain is from Maverick City? So she's a good friend of ours, and <clears throat> they asked us to come speak at our church. So me and my wife went up there. And, um, this is my second time speaking there. Last year there was a young lady who had a tumor. They caught it late, <clears throat> and uh, she came to the altar, and I prayed for her. And uh, I didn't know the whole story. I, I, I go back a year later, and uh, the leader of the house asked me to just come up and start praying for people, and I did, and she came up. And I didn't know who she was, and she was crying. She said, I, I don't know if you remember me, but you prayed for me last year. I had a tumor. And she said, uh, the doctors removed it. And so I'm like, okay. And, uh, and she said, but it came back. And now she's like bawling, crying. She's just bawling, crying. Because they're saying like there's really nothing they could do or whatever. And uh, I'm just kind of kind of talking to the Lord in my heart and saying if there's anything specific. I didn't feel anything specific. I just felt led to just do what God said in his word. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So I laid my hands on it. I prayed over and when I was praying over, you kind of felt, I felt some things. I felt like, I felt what life brought, the anger and the frustration and the confusion. So I'm praying against that stuff. And man, she just began to, ah, and so all this stuff. So I'm just praying, blessing her. And uh, we get home, maybe like two weeks later, two weeks later, I get a, a DM request in, on Instagram. So I go to it, and it's this long DM explaining the whole situation. Went there, tumor, they removed it, blah, blah, blah. I was in this. I stopped going to church. I felt like the Lord told me to come when I was doing this conference. I went back. And I'm thinking, what are the odds a year later when I go to New York, she finally comes back to church, and the tumor that I prayed for a year ago is back? Now, obviously, the doctor removed it, but she's back this time. So I pray. She sends a message saying she went to the doctor, and they cannot find the tumor. Imagine if all of the stuff that I prayed for that I didn't see happen was influenced in my life. I would never pray for her. I remember I was super on fire. I mean, you couldn't take me to the mailbox. Somebody getting Jesus. <laughs> this is what it is. They're getting Jesus. Even now, if I sit, on the, if, if I sit next to a person on the plane, it's going down. Okay, it's going down. But ah, I was so on fire. Even when I first met my wife, we was at a fair. It was in Arizona. And uh, I'm not going to retell the story. She always said, you tell it wrong. You tell it wrong. <laughs> and I want a good night tonight. So I ain't, no, nah, it's, it's, it's a good night every night. But, um, but um, I remember it was the first time we was out on a date. And I had been telling her about some stuff that we was, you know, just doing, seeing in the streets. And I seen this lady, on a, she was on a walker, and I beelined her. I was holding my, she was my girlfriend at the time, and I beelined her. I started walking, and she was like, no, 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 no. And I was like, girl, come on, you know? And uh, I remember her, like, being kind of timid. And then a few months later, I see her at, like, a uh, uh, Cracker Barrel, like, praying for the waitress. I seen, like, the effects of someone else's life being on fire, how it starts to influence someone else's life. You know, when I first met Pastor, I don't know if you know Pastor Dan Moeller. So I met Pastor Dan, my life wasn't a certain kind of way. But his fire lit me on fire. And I started like my friends on fire. And I see them like our university on fire. We had a, a play at Kentucky State University in a theater that sits 1500, it's a college campus. It's packed to capacity. We don't even have enough room to hold all the students that are coming down to the altar. We don't have enough room. We're seeing students walk over chairs to get to the altar. And all of this becomes moments in time when you allow life to redefine your fire. All you have is your history, nothing current. Because we, you know, we just weighed down. So here's what I'm saying. Holy Spirit today, today, I feel Holy Spirit wants to just lift that. Not anything deep. I mean, he might be deep. It may, I don't know how he wants to, but I just feel like he just wants to lift life off of us, 
move it out of the way, breathe on us afresh, and say, okay, let's go back at this. Amen? Amen. Can we invite him to do that? Okay. I don't know how we're just going to see how he does. Just close your eyes right where you are. Right where you are. <clears throat> this is the way the Lord just kind of deals with me. There's a biblical basis for this. Second Corinthians 4. Paul said that we are those that have renounced the hidden things of the heart. Renouncing is you saying, I'm no longer allowing these things in my heart that I know that have caused me to do this, say this. I'm renouncing this today. I no longer want to be in fellowship with this. I don't want this. This stuff may involve relationships that, you know, whatever. Holy Spirit will give you grace to step out of stuff. And, but right now, it is us and God, and we need to renounce the hidden things of our hearts. The shame, you know, it may be like you feel like you compromised. You may not feel your fire and your passion like you used to and whatever it is. I want you out of your mouth, you don't have to be loud, but I want you to have the boldness that as Holy Spirit brings these things to your attention or the things that you are aware of, I want you to start to renounce it. I want you to start to let it go. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to come and just remove and set you free from what that thing has brought in your life. Right now, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you search our hearts and whatever it is in their lives, in our lives, find it, bring it to our attention. We want your life in your way. Your life in your way. Some of us need to renounce addictions, alcohol, pornography, masturbation. Get that stuff out of your heart. Get that stuff out of your heart. There's a life waiting for you. It's the life of Christ. You can walk in authority and power over habits and addictions. Just begin to utter those things to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I don't want this. You know, it could be a situation that happened when you was younger. I was touched wrong, and I've never been the same. And it's always driven me, and I don't want this in my life no more. I'm willing to lay down this life. I don't want this life. I want a new life. I want the life that comes with your blood. I want the life you've paid for. I have lived just a normal uh, Western culture, Christianity, and I don't, I want the life that your word displays. I want to know what they laid their life down for. Give me the passion and the zeal. I want it. I don't want to just come to church. Show me how to live as the church. I don't want it. I don't want to just go through this life. I want to see what it's like to live in your spirit. That if I eat anything deadly, it will not harm me. That I lay my hands on this. I want to see that in my life. I want to know what it's like to be free. Would you manifest your manifold wisdom through me? Would you release me from this today? I give you my life. I give you the regret. I give you the unforgiveness. Show me how to forgive them. Show me how to let it go. Show me how to move on. Show me how to forgive myself. 
Sin has condemned me, has shamed me, and I want to be free. Come on, talk to him like that. It's you, God, that works in us to will and to do. Bring the will, the desire in me, and then the power to live it out. Let this covenant come to our homes. Let this covenant come to our jobs. Let this covenant, Lord, seize this region and this state. You brought revival to all of Ephesus. Give us the faith to believe for those kind of things. You're still here, Lord in and through us. Father, I pray that as we take covenant, as we break this bread, we do it in a worthy manner, understanding what this body is for. It's not something that we're just stepping into. It's not something that we're trying to get. This is who we've become. You laid stripes, wounds, judgment. You've seen every sin that humanity would commit, not just me, humanity. And you put all of that judgment on the Lord's body. The effects of sin, you put it on his body. The results of sin, you put it on his body so that it does not and will not be on me. As we eat this bread, we believe, we bring into remembrance that truth. Not something we're trying to get, Lord. We are affirming that this is what happened. This is our condition. We eat your flesh. The body took the effects of sin the blood removes the sin, not just the effects. We have redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sin. Lord, your body, your blood has removed the spiritual nature of sin the judgment of sin, the person of sin, the destination of sin, you have freed us. And all that's left is your life. That's all we have. That's all we have is your life. The same life we read about, empowered by the Spirit, the same healing, the same miracles, the same conviction, the same heart, the same relationship. That's the life we have. That's the life that flows through our veins. We have the mind of Christ. And they overcame him by the blood. Thank you for this blood. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This means every thought, every thought that comes in your mind that's not saying this, you know that that thought is a lie. So don't believe it's you. Don't embrace that it's you. You cast it down by remembering and holding to the truth. And the truth make you free, amen?